Impact Lounge is the number one YouTube channel for fans of Impact Wrestling. Make, make a, make a, uh, a good, good lucha, lucha thing. It's just a fact of life. What's up, folks? This is BQ, and I am here to talk the seven worst Impact Wrestling signings since 2016, which is basically the Impact on Pop era. About the time that I started the channel, started covering the company. So in the time that I have existed as both the King of the Mountain podcast and the Impact Lounge, these are the seven biggest bombs. In the comments below, let me know your thoughts on these seven signings. And anyone else that you can think of, let me know in the comments as well. And let's get into it. Number seven, Tyrus. Now, Tyrus was not new to the company, but in early 2017, upon Jeff Jarrett taking over, Tyrus took a knee a la Colin Kaepernick on Instagram and stated his refusal to show up at the next set of tapings, upset over his booking, spot on the card, and did not want to work for Jarrett and the new Global Force Wrestling. He was just getting ready to begin an angle with Congo Kong for Bound for Glory. Now, in 2018, Tyrus returned to the company upon the departure of Jarrett and appeared motivated under the new direction of Impact Wrestling. He was reintroduced alongside EC3 and after a week or two turned on EC3 and even went over him in a match. Tyrus was later inserted into a body shaming angle with Richard Justice, Falaba, and KM. He was quick to once again announce his departure saying being involved with a company who gets 300,000 viewers a week and is associating themselves with smaller wrestling companies such as Lucha Underground was bad for his brand. Tyrus won Bound for Gold 2015 and eventually faced Drew Galloway in the opening match, not the main event of an Impact show, and was never given another title opportunity again. Tyrus felt he was a main event talent, however, nobody else did. To my knowledge, Tyrus has never won a major championship. Number six, Hanaya the Huntress. Hanaya was introduced to the Impact audience by attacking Rosemary in Ottawa after Bound for Glory. Her signing had been rumored and unofficial for several months, and she was supposed to be a major addition to the Knockouts roster after doing some pretty good work with Women of Honor. A lot of fans were excited to have this extremely attractive and athletic woman added to the roster. But Hanaya only lasted that set of tapings and took several losses to Rosemary, with it being rumored to have no-showed a couple independent bookings set up by Impact. She allegedly had a poor attitude backstage and even brushed off receiving advice from Gail Kim. She thanked Impact on social media, citing a mutual decision to part ways. But it was unfortunate to see such a talented worker be released after waiting months for her to debut. Number five, Magnus. Magnus is currently doing some pretty amazing work as the NWA champion and as of current time is getting prepared to face Cody at the All In Show. Now while the man known as Nick Aldis is doing some of the best work of his career, his return to Impact as the Global Force Wrestling Champion was a complete flop. Aldis was hyped as a major return and was rumored to be receiving big dollars, which he would later say was not true and that he wasn't being paid his worth. He worked a couple decent matches, but ultimately dropped the GFW title to Alberto El Patron. After that, most fans seemed to have lost interest, and he departed with some not-so-nice things to say about the direction of the company, saying it was no longer the company he used to work for, and it was sad. Magnus said he was only supposed to come in and drop the GFW title as a favor to Jeff Jarrett, but I think the original intention by Double J was to make him a main event player. One of several bombs made by Jeff Jarrett in just a few months. Number four, Brandy Rhodes. Believe it or not, at the time of her signing, Brandy was one of the biggest names to be signed by TNA and one of the last moves by Dixie Carter. She brought a little needed star power and I thought it was a great move at the time. Brandy appeared very motivated to become a knockout and did, did generate some decent crowd reaction even in Orlando. She worked a big angle alongside Cody versus Mike Bennett and Maria Kanellis, but after that seemed a little lost in the shuffle to the fans, even though I think Dixie was attempting to push her as a future knockouts champion. Brandy had been ring announcing in WWE, but asked for her release because she wanted an opportunity to wrestle. In an interview with Josh Matthews, she said she would show off her, quote, badass athleticism, but most of her matches were not very good and she moved around the ring as if she had two left feet. 
Towards the end, she was in an awful angle with Moose and Decay, and then quickly faded as the new GFW and Anthem management had no interest in retaining her. She seemed to catch on in Ring of Honor, doing a lot better than she did in Impact, but her signing for the most part was a huge letdown. Number three, the miracle Mike Bennett. Mike Bennett and Maria came from Ring of Honor and were supposed to be really big deals, and he was supposed to be a future world's champion. The initial run of Bennett was really good, though, and he established himself as one of the top heels and an up-and-coming mic worker after relying on his ring work for the most part in ROH and New Japan. Now, his initial gimmick song was sunglasses, a suit, fedora, and some attitude and swag, but he quickly transitioned into a man bun, pineapple patterns, and bright colors. TNA gave him a lot of spotlight, a lot of on-screen time, and even allowed him to be the first man to pin Ethan Carter III. During his time with the company, he had nothing but good things to say and even planned on re-signing after his deal was up until Kevin Owens convinced him to wait on an offer from WWE. Since he worked his last couple months on a per-night basis, he lost most of his matches and even received a random beatdown from Robbie E. at the end of the big wedding angle. Bennett would be the only star since AJ Styles to bypass NXT and appear on the main roster. Actually, I believe the... Uh, Bullet Club guys did as well. But he showed up out of shape and came in billed as Mike Kanellis, taking his wife's last name, and even lost his first big pay-per-view match. He pretty much jobbed out to everyone since joining the company, and I believe he set the Royal Rumble record for being eliminated the fastest. Now, he stands up for his decision on social media, citing his improved financial situation, and even hopped on the anti-TNA bandwagon briefly to appease the WWE fans online. I'm sure he has no regrets, but it's sad for a guy who could have benefited from one more year with TNA and a run with the world title. Personally, I think it gave us an example of why accepting shortcuts to the top before you're ready for them can be really damaging. That's whatever career you're in. His only title win would be a joke of a run with the X Division Championship. And I think it's safe to say he's burnt his bridge with Impact Wrestling, and I don't think he's going to have a very long WWE career. Number two, Aaron Rex. The biggest free agent signing in a long time would be the man formerly known as Damian Sandow. Now, I liked Aaron Rex. Let me be clear. I was on board with the signing, and I thought it was going to be a really major move. I remember calling him a must-sign due to his ability to get over and put butts in seats. Now, it worked at first. He cut a really great promo on a live episode of Impact, which is actually hilarious to look back and watch now. But he had the crowd fully engaged, and there were even more people there to see him in the Impact Zone that night. Aaron Rex said he was doing things his way, and you know he's telling the truth. He promised huge things with Impact Wrestling despite appearing completely out of shape. And despite that, the company immediately portrayed him as a main event character, even having a couple stare downs with then champion Bobby Lashley. It was interesting to see him compete instead of doing comedy, and he was even involved in a big angle with Drew Galloway, who was hot, hot as a heel at the time. Rex was scheduled to face Drew Galloway at Bound for Glory in the main event of the Grand Championship Tournament, but Drew would end up hurt and Rex would instead face Eddie Edwards. Believe it or not, Aaron Rex had tournament wins over Trevor Lee and Eli Drake in what I thought was a huge mistake, became the initial Grand Champion, furthering the stigma and stereotype that former WWE stars would immediately be given championship gold. His Bound for Glory match with Eddie saw five minute rounds instead of three and it was extremely slow and boring. The concept of the Grand Championship didn't catch on and we saw a few less than impressive matches by him under that format and he mainly feuded with Jesse Goddard. He began to transition to a heel after the fans quickly got bored of him and although it was nice to see him as a serious competitor, doing things his way he was too serious and lacked any of the entertaining qualities and charisma that got him over in WWE. He then abruptly changed his gimmick in a last-ditch effort to do a Liberace, Gorgeous George type of character, and it never really got a chance, if we're being fair and we're being honest. Some fans loved it, some hated it, but the new management quickly let him go, along with Brandy Rhodes, as it seemed like they didn't want any of Dixie Carter's former WWE signings to stick around. I think most fans were really disappointed in how his run shook out because he could have been and should have been a really big deal. Number one, who else but Alberto El Patron, the man who showed up and won the world title on night one. After Bully Ray decided not to sign, his money was directed 
towards El Patron, and he quickly received a monster push to the top that included three world title wins, one of those being the Global Force Wrestling title for Magnus. For the most part, I think he did some really good work, and he really generated a crowd reaction anytime he came out. But after an alleged domestic incident with his then fiance Paige, he was suspended for the company and stripped of his world title. For the most part, this was a huge PR disaster, but the company did save a little face with that suspension. He ended up making his return at Bound for Glory 2017 and literally speaking ruined the main event between Eli Drake and Johnny Impact. He also cut a promo at the show that was probably about five minutes too long and it zapped any of the energy out of the crowd. The company was still determined to make him a top heel, however, and again skyrocketed him to the top, making him the number one contender to face Austin Aries for the title at Redemption. Alberto, this was his second chance, mind you, no-showed the Impact vs. Lucha Underground pay-per-view and was quickly released from the company. After weeks of pre-recorded TV building the feud that I fully expected El Patron to win, by the way, they had to make a last-minute change, adding Phoenix and Pentagon Jr. to the match, which ended up being a better main event. El Patron made Impact Wrestling look like fools for giving him a second opportunity, and to this day blames all of his faults on everyone else but himself. He definitely ended up being the worst Impact Wrestling signing in the last couple of years, and the number one biggest bomb. Let me know your thoughts and your other biggest bombs in the comments below. Hey, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Check out the video below for more Impact Wrestling related content. This is the Impact Lounge.